So I'm going to introduce Becky Robinson. Okay, I'm still admitting. I thought maybe we're, no, I'm just going to still keeping admitting people and introduce Becky Robinson. Um, so Becky is uh, here today. She has a very exciting topic for us, which clearly there was a lot of interest in. And she's going to talk to us about author marketing, which we all need to know how to do. And we all know, just like everything writing, it's hard and it's a skill set and we've got to figure it out. So Becky is the founder and CEO of Weaving Influence, which is a digital marketing firm. So I'm going to guess she knows what she's talking about. Awesome. She is host of the Book Marketing Podcast, and we're going to put some links up in a bit. She is the author of Reach create the biggest possible audience uh, for your message book or cause so this is what we're all trying to do and she has three kids grown and because she's not busy enough with you know companies and 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 podcasts and writing books she's also a marathon runner which you know that takes no time out of your day when you're practicing for marathons it's like just free time everywhere so i'm gonna guess she writes a book in her head while she's running but that's just a thought so <laughs> becky welcome and over to you it is so fun to be with all of you today and i want to tell you that i love being in this format where we can engage with each other and ask questions in the moment so i want you to feel free while i'm speaking to go ahead and put any of your questions into the chat i am a decent multitasker and so I will do my best to attend to your questions throughout the event so that we can make this as engaging and interactive as possible. And I'm honored that you would choose to spend an hour of your day with me. Um, before I start to share my slides, I do have slides. I'll be happy to send you the deck later or if uh, Christina wants to send the deck around as well. Um, I don't know, someone's saying they can't see me. I don't know um, if you like to use that spotlight feature or if you want to switch to the view that's the speaker view, then you should be able to see me because I'm here. Yeah, I, um, I see you there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so before I sh share my slides, I will tell you that most of my work across the last 12 years as the um, leader at Weaving Influence has been with nonfiction authors. And I know that most of you are fiction authors, uh, but I think there's a great deal of transferability of the concepts. So I'm going to do my best as I talk to you today to frame up my ideas in a way that will reach you as a fiction author. Um, and if I happen to get away from that, feel free to tell me that in a kind way in the chat as well. And I'll make sure that I remember that I'm talking to fiction authors today. Um, I personally love to read fiction. One of the places I get stuck in my business is that I get all of these nonfiction books on my desk and I'd really rather read the fiction books. So I'm going to admit that to all of you as well. Um, and I have done some work with fiction authors. I have a good friend, uh, Stephanie Lansom, who writes uh, historical fiction, and I've had the chance to weigh in on her marketing efforts over the years. And I'm also also always a student on social media watching what writers are doing. So I'm going to ask quickly, who here loves Threads, the newest social platform from Meta? If you are not there yet, it's so fun and there's real people in real time and lots of writers. Is there anybody on the call who likes Threads? Anybody, anybody? Find me there. I love it. It's the place where I'm showing up the most authentically at the moment. It's it's really fun. If If you were on Twitter in the early days, um, I was on Twitter, I think, starting in 2009, and Twitter at that time was, like, super interactive, like, real people, real time, very supportive, wonderful. Uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Twitter at the moment, but Threads is, like, the old Twitter um, for sure. So if you're interested, we can talk about, about that later. Um, but for now, I'm going to dive into our topic today. And what I want to talk with you about is optimizing the four phases of reach to grow influence. And I'll have some stories along the way. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell all of you how crowded the book publishing market is. And I don't even know if this stat is still true. Um, but, you know, there are a crap ton of books being published all the time. You know, most will never sell more than 250 copies in their first year. And having partnered with authors, I know how hard it is to sell books. And I know how much pressure that you feel, particularly if you're traditionally published, to sell more books so that you can get that next deal. And if you're self-publishing, you likely want to sell more books so that you can fund the publication of the next book. Um, 
And so what we want to talk about today are some ways to, to break out of the crowd um, and to get beyond, uh, you know, that dismal number that most of us see when we're looking at uh, the number of books that we can sell. So most of you are in this business of writing fiction, or if you write nonfiction too, you're a writer because you love writing. And uh, Christine and I were talking a little bit together before we uh, let all of you into the room. And one of the things she said is, you know, we're all about kindness and then writing, but we all are serious about the craft of writing. And I, I believe her that you each want to write really great uh books that people can enjoy. And probably when you decided that you wanted to be a writer, you weren't also deciding that you wanted to be the chief marketing officer for your book. But the reality in 2024 is that if you're a writer, you also, whether you signed up for it or not, have this role as the chief marketing officer for your book. And for most authors that I meet, this balance that we have to find between uh, marketing and our writing is is awful it's terrible because we'd rather be writing than marketing and a lot of times what i hear from authors is well as soon as the book is done then i'll focus on my marketing um but then right after your book is done you want to write the next one um so learning how to balance these two priorities is a critical factor for you if you want to be successful uh, the next thing is that selling books is very hard it does require focus consistent effort you know, sometimes people will tell me the reason I don't like marketing, Becky, is because I don't want to promote myself. Have you ever said that? Um, and so I want to offer an important reframe. If you are promoting a book, you are not promoting yourself. You are promoting a message or a story. And those of us who love fiction, we love it because it transports us to another world. It allows us to see ourselves in a new way. You know, it um opens up our minds to new ways of being and belonging and so when you are promoting your novel or your short story or your work your work of fiction you are promoting basically this magical uh entry into a new world you are not promoting yourself um so hopefully that's a helpful reframe and if you get nothing out of this call i hope you'll take that one with you uh, something else to remember is a book is a valuable asset to, to promote over years, not over months. How many of us, if we were to name our favorite novel, are going to name a novel that was published in 2023 or 2024? Chances are you may have a favorite novel that spans back to your childhood. And so if you're creating a story that's evergreen, people will be discovering it for years into the future. So you don't have to panic about marketing being something that has to happen instantly, but it's something that you can continue to invest in over time. Um, Finally, I, I do want you to know that you can make a difference with the writing that you're doing and that there are some proven and practical approaches that can help you get more success. So I want to say thank you to Lisa. I can see her face and my slides and she keeps nodding. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I, I went too far. So let me let me go back here. Um, so uh, one of the analogies that I like to use when I talk about book marketing is the analogy of a wedding. And if you were on this call, um, potentially you have, um, some of you have gotten married. And one of the things we know about getting married is you need to plan your wedding far in advance if you want to get the right venue. And if you want to have all of your invitees able to come, and you might know that planning a wedding is very expensive. So, you know, if you're planning to launch a book, uh, know that it takes planning and preparation. And I see a question from, is it Eileen or Aileen? Hopefully I'll say your name correctly. Um, when is a good time to start marketing your book? The time to start marketing your book is before you even start writing it. So I wanna talk to you next about the four phases of uh, reach or the four phases of marketing your book. Um, and hopefully this will be helpful for you. And as I go through these four phases, I would love to see in the chat, where are you on this journey? So from the time you dream of marketing a book until the day uh, 
about six months before the book is going to come out, you are in what I call the building phase. And we'll talk a little bit about the things you can do in the building phase. But if your book is coming out more than six months from now, then you are in this building phase. Um, I call the six months, the four to six months leading up to your book's publication, I call those the working phase. And there's a really simple reason I call them the working phase. If you've launched a book, you know why, because preparing for your book launch is a lot of work. So that's why I call it the working phase. <laughs> uh, launching phase is the month surrounding your publication date or your launch date. Launching is not for one day. Um, and typically we have, you know, during the working phase, we're putting everything into place so that we can get a lot of momentum at launch. Um, from about a month after your book comes out, um, until the next one comes out, or for as long as you want to promote that book, I call that the advancing phase. It's how do we keep our book out in front of audiences after the initial excitement of the launch has concluded. So why don't you take a quick moment in the chat. Um, I will focus my energy on these uh, phases, depending on where you all are. So where are you? Which phase are you at right now? Looks like Debbie is in building. Christina is in working. We've got uh, working, launching. Now, if you have more than one book, you could be in more than one at the same time. And so what I'll tell you is that sometimes I show this graphic in a circle because you, you are basically cycling through all of them at any time. And the priorities that you have in advancing are very similar to the priorities that you have during building. And so once your book comes out, anything that you're doing is building toward the launch of the next book. So thanks to all of you who are sharing that in the chat about where you are on the journey. Um, great, sorry, just scrolling through to take a look at that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the building phase. And when you're in the building phase, there are basically three key priorities. And Cindy, yes, you will be able to rewatch this. And the good news is most of this stuff is in my book. And when we get to the end of the call, if you live in the U.S., I have a link. I'll share it with you. If you would like a free copy of my book, I'd be happy to send you a signed copy if you're in the United States. Um, so I'll get that link for you later. Or if you choose to buy it, that's okay, too. Um, any of that will work. If you're not in the U.S., I can send you a PDF. Or if I can buy you one on Amazon, I'll, I'll do it that way. But I can't, like, ship internationally. It's cost too much money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I just put the link up too as well for anyone who wants to grab it on Amazon. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. So all of this is in my book. All of this is um, going to be available in a recording. And uh, if you go to Weaving Influence YouTube channel, I have many, many free webinars on YouTube that you can watch as well. All right. So when you're in the building phase, there are basically three things that you want to be building. Uh, connections, contacts, and content. So you might wonder why is Becky saying connections and contacts aren't those the same thing? So when I talk about connections, I'm talking about social media. Um, you want to grow your social media accounts as big as you can, as fast as you can to create a wider audience for your message. Now, you know, some authors will say, do I have to be on every single social media platform? And I want to tell you something that hopefully will relieve you and relax you. No, you do not have to be on all the social media channels. Um, I typically advise that you think about the social media channels that your intended audience or audiences are most likely using and choose one or two that you enjoy engaging on and let the rest go. So I'll tell you, I'm not on TikTok. I'm no longer on Twitter. Um, I'm hardly on Facebook. Because I work with nonfiction authors, primarily my, my primary channels are LinkedIn and Instagram and now Threads. And I focus most of my energy on those. Um, so if you're in the build up to a book launch, what you want to be able to do is identify the channels that you intend to use, that you're able to consistently sustain over time and focus your energy on growing those as big as you can, as fast as you can. When I talk about contacts, I am talking about your permission-based email list. So I'm curious to hear how many of you have invested in building a permission-based email list where people come to your website and they opt in to hear from you in an ongoing way. Um, some of you have done that, great. Um, I also see a question here. Do you know what the best social platform for fiction authors is? 
And the hard, the hard thing is I don't, I would say, you know, obviously LinkedIn is more of a business facing platform. So for those of you who are primarily writing fiction, unless you're also building a business that's like editing or publishing or something else that requires you to be on LinkedIn in order to discover readers. You know, I have heard fiction authors say that Twitter has been a good platform. I'm seeing that Threads is a good platform. You know, if you have the capacity to create video content, TikTok, obviously book talk and all that fame um, is good. But it's only good if that's a place where you can joyfully create content. If you don't like to create video, it's not the place for you. Um, so I would say, you know, depending on the age of the audience that you're trying to reach, Facebook and Instagram are probably the most uh, effective platforms for fiction authors. Um, so if you're skewing toward an older audience of readers, you might choose Facebook as a primary platform. If you're hoping to get a slightly younger audience, maybe Instagram. Um, but you know, I'm 52 years old and like, I'm not skewing younger and I like Instagram. So, um, all that, right. So in the building phase, you want to grow your email list. You want to grow your social connections. You also want to be creating content. Now as a fiction author, this is a little less intuitive. So when I think about nonfiction, you know, I will tell folks that anything you're creating on uh, social media in terms of your thought leadership and expertise, any of that can later become a book. Or when you're a nonfiction author, you can take your book and break it into pieces to share content on social media. So as a fiction author, you do need to be a little bit more creative about the content that you're creating. And I'm going to try a few ideas for you um, in terms of the kind of content that fiction authors can create. So you can create backstory um, on social media. You can tell about your characters. You can pull out themes from your novel. Um, you can also share just the craft of writing. You know, people who love r reading fiction also want to know about the author, the, the person behind the scenes. For those who are doing historical fiction, you can tell the true stories behind uh, the historical fiction that you're writing. For those who are writing fantasy, you can share about the worlds that you're creating. So uh, from a not a marketer perspective, it's harder for me to speak into the types of content on social media from fiction, uh, but you all are creative. So I'm sure that you could probably add to the list that I'm sharing as well. Uh, Deborah's asking, why do I like Instagram? Um, you know, I think there is a, a robust community of readers and writers on Instagram. Bookstagram is something you've probably heard of. Um, I like the visual aspect of Instagram, just the being able to share photos and being able to share, um, you know, short videos for those of you who want to create those reels are quite engaging. Um, you know, honestly, I think the social media that you end up loving is the social media where you can figure out how to connect. Um, you know, I, I, I think that one of the reasons why people shrink back from marketing is because of that, that feeling that you're just like pumping out noise. Uh, but I think the true value in social media is the connections. Like think about the joy of being in this room together. And social media can be like that if you choose to show up in an authentic and human way and get to know people in, in real time. So I would say choose the one that you enjoy. Um, so this slide just talks about uh, growing your email list. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so important to grow an email list is that social media algorithms limit the reach of the content that you're sharing. So if you're depending upon social media as being the place that you're going to announce your book when it's available or announce this book and the next book and the next book, you know, you may only be reaching a fraction of the people who have chosen to follow you on social media. But when you can convert those social media followers into people who have opted in to your permission-based email list, then you have a much higher likelihood of being able to actually have them read the content that you're sending. So I, if I had a choice, I would invest more energy in growing that permission-based email list so I have that instant connection with people. Uh, the other thing is, you know, sometimes it's beyond our control. Social media platforms ebb and flow, they change. So for example, you know, I had 30,000 followers on Twitter and then Twitter stopped being an effective platform for me. So if I spent all that time growing Twitter and then 
Twitter becomes obsolete. You know, you need a way to have your contacts be more portable so that they stay with you wherever you are. Um, so if you have any questions about uh, permission-based email list, if we have some time at the end, I'd be happy to talk some more about that. So this is the building phase, and you want to focus on building uh, connections on social media, contacts through your permission-based email list and content to fuel the value that you can offer to the world. Um, so if, if you'd like to share, you could reflect now. Uh, what are the approaches that you've used that have been most effective for you in creating connections and growing your social media platform? If you have a tip or two that you want to share in the chat, or where do you see opportunities to grow new connections? Um, you know, I see this room as a great place to grow new connections as well. Elaine, good idea using Instagram to get people to your email list. So Stephanie Lansom, the fiction author uh, who I mentioned, who's a good friend, you know, one of the ways she's been growing her email list is by doing like a monthly book giveaway. So um, the monthly book giveaway serves two purposes. She has other fiction authors who have become a part of her community. When she does a book giveaway, she's promoting those other authors. Um, and then people will sign up for her email list because they want the chance to get free books. Um, so, oh, I just love this. Um, I love seeing people's input here. Uh, contacting similar authors is a really great way to uh, fuel connections. Hiring a team for social media could be helpful. Um, going to a convention and meeting a publisher who wants to bring you to the conventions is an amazing opportunity to build new connections. So I wanna do say a word about that. So if in-person connecting is a really big part of what you're doing as an author, like if you're doing um, book events or having a table at book events or doing things at your local mall or whatever, one of the things you always wanna be thinking about is how do you get those offline connections to your online spaces? So how do you make sure if you're meeting people face to face that they'll also follow you on social Social media or add, uh, uh, become a part of your email list so that you can stay in touch with them. I had this one nonfiction author who I supported for like over 10 years and he spoke in front of you know church groups and organization groups and he, he was traveling all around the world. What he never did is get those people onto his email list. And so I was always saying to him, like, you need at the end of your slide deck, you need to have a QR code. You need to give away some kind of freebie so that people sign up for your list. Uh, and so you want to think about that whenever you're with people face to face. How do you stay connected to them also in online spaces? All right, well, let's talk about the working phase. This is the six months leading up to the launch of your book. And what you're doing in the working phase is a lot of hard work. Um, you can bag and offer cookies to get people on your email list. Of course, that sounds perfect. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that you can do during the working phase. Uh, my number one favorite thing that you can do in the working phase is to get your book into people's hands so they are ready to write Amazon reviews on the day your book comes out. Um, and so obviously it's a lot of work uh, and a lot of money uh, to be able to get uh, copies of your book printed before it comes out. This picture in the middle is uh, of the time that I had 2,500 copies of my client's book delivered to my garage. That's what 2,500 copies of a book looks like. We distributed two books in every package to a launch team of 1,250 people. And this is the, oops, I got to get back to that picture. On the right is uh my children who were much smaller at the time. Two of these are mine and one's a friend. And I had to put them to work packaging all those books into the shipping envelopes because at the time I didn't have a shipping manager in my company. And so it was my kids who had to do the hard work of getting books out into the world. So I'm curious to hear in the chat how many of you have, you know, had a launch team or a street team or book ambassadors as you've launched your books into the world. You know, a lot of what we do in the built the working phase is you know identifying the people in your network who can help to share your book with others getting those advanced copies out if there's a pr campaign that's the time that you're writing your media kit it's the time that you're pitching media for articles or events at the time your book comes out um, it's the time that you're planning any events um, so michael only launches ebooks got it um, so that would be some of the things that you're doing um, in the working phase, creating graphics to highlight your book, uh, writing all the social media content. Um, 
So I'm curious to hear um, from you, um, have you done the hard work of identifying the people who can help support your book launch? And have you shared your book with others and has that resulted in sales for you? Um, 50 on the launch team at the moment. So a quick note about launch teams. Um, I don't know how it is for fiction, but in the nonfiction world, we, we have discovered that you need a launch team that is three to four times the size of your initial Amazon review goal in order to reach the goal. So for some context, when my book came out, I had a goal to get 100 Amazon reviews in the first month, and my launch team was 278 people. And it took me 78 days to get 100 Amazon reviews. Then since then, I've like gotten up to 149 and then I'm stuck. So um, if you've launched a book before and you found getting Amazon reviews hard, either like virtually or show me your hand, I can only actually see a few people since I'm looking at my slides. Maybe tell me in the chat. Getting Amazon reviews is really, really hard. Um, so Elaine is recruiting launch team members. What I would say is maybe there's some people on this call who want to support Elaine by joining her launch team. All right, so let's talk about the launching phase. So the launching phase is the month surrounding the publication of your book. Uh, you want to get a lot of momentum uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons is uh, to be able to rank as a bestseller in Amazon in your category. It's to teach the Amazon algorithms that your book is worth reading. It's, uh, you know, to get more opportunities for more people to hear about your book. So for launch team, you know, when you say launch, everyone thinks it's a party, which of course a party is fun. Um, if you had a launch party for one of your books in person, you can go ahead and tell me that in the chat. Um, this is a launch party that I attended, I think back in 2015, like a really long time ago. Um, and here's some pictures from my launch party, my team, threw me a surprise party. Um, and I wanted to show the photos from the launch party because I think sometimes the photos from the party are as important as the party itself. Um, because you can then share those on social media. You can share the excitement of bringing your book into the world. Um, and it's another way to remind people and reinforce the fact that you had a book that came out without, you know, just constantly only saying, you know, buy my book. I'm also a huge believer in virtual launch celebrations. If you have had a virtual launch or an in-person launch party, I'd love to see that in the chat. Uh, the reason I love virtual launch parties is that you can bring your network together on the day that your book comes out, and then you can drive key calls to action and support that your network can bring to you, whether that's, you know, go buy my book right now on Amazon, review my book on Amazon, share my book with others. Um, and I find that that can create the momentum that you need to rank as an Amazon bestseller because you're concentrating those sales all in an, in a short hour or a day. I'm going to pause and take some water here. Uh, is Nikki here who did the amazing Facebook launch party? One of my very favorite things is hosting uh, virtual launch events on Zoom. It's it's like one of my favorite parts of my job because it's such a special time for people. So whether you have an in person, Nikki, yeah, yeah. Nikki on that on the on the launch party. So I was at that launch party with Nikki too, and it was great. And one of the things that was really fantastic is how many people from the fictionary community showed up to support her. So if anybody is having a Facebook launch party, please post it out on the community, invite everybody because. Clearly our community is online people and it, it was really, really fun. And I think, I think Nikki was really appreciative of everybody from the community who went. That is amazing. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I'm going to keep looking in the chat. And so a few things to consider um, that you can do during your launch month. Obviously some of these cost money and some do not, you know, uh, some authors will choose to invest in like a podcast online or print media campaign. Obviously, we're, we all are investing in social media outreach. Uh, the time that your book is launching is the most important time to be communicating with your email list. And, you know, I would say even 
sending more emails than you're probably comfortable with to make sure that people see and receive your messages. You know, a lot of times authors will tell me, like, I can't keep posting about my book on social media. The the month that your book launches is a time then people completely understand that you can show up in a way to talk about your book more. Um, and the other thing to remember is because the algorithms don't show your content to everyone every time, you might have to post the same announcement about your book multiple times before you can really saturate your following. I had gone on a work trip maybe about six months after my book came out and I ran into a, a colleague who I thought was pretty tuned in to what I'm up to, and he didn't even know I had a book. So, um, you know, definitely my experience is that it, it takes multiple exposures before people take action or uh, buy your book or even know that you have a book. Um, so a few other possibilities would be Amazon advertising. Uh, for those of you who haven't tried it, Am Amazon ads can be a low cost way to help readers discover your book. Uh, you might wanna consider a, a press release using a wire um, as a means of growing SEO for your name and book title. And then, you know, on the nonfiction side, we recommend doing webinars with key subject matter from your book. Now, for fiction authors, you know, you may want to instead choose to host a book group or study group or discussion group. Or if there are key themes in your book that are very critical to you, you could also host a webinar uh, to talk about that. Yeah, Anna, as far as podcasts go, I think podcasts are tremendous and I never say no to an invitation. You know, sometimes people will say like, oh, I got to make sure it's a really, you know, well listened to podcast. I only want to be on the top podcasts. And I would say like, as long as your schedule allows it, I try to say yes to every single opportunity that comes my way uh, because you never know you know, what serendipitous connection could come or who might hear what you have to say or who might really need uh, to find your book uh, or be connected with you. So yes, yes to podcasts. All right, so giving away books, and I, I did mention earlier on the call that I'm happy to give away books. And as soon as I'm not sharing my screen, I'll grab a link and put it in the chat for you. Um, if you can't afford to buy my book, I'm happy to give you one. Or even if you'd rather that I just give you one, I'm happy to give you one. Uh, I believe that books are seeds. And the more of your books that you can get into the world, the more your book will have the chance to, to expand uh, across any boundaries that there may be. So I recommend, you know, during the launch week to give away as many of your books as you can. Now you're hopefully getting those out pre-publication. Um, and I envision doing this in three buckets of people. So the first bucket is the bucket I call like the VIPs. So likely on your journey, there are friends, family, neighbors, the people that you mentioned in your acknowledgments, you know, those very special people that you want to give a book to, no strings attached. Uh, when I uh, did that giveaway before my book came out, that group for me was about 100 people. You know, my mom, my brothers, you know, all, all of the kind of special people in your life. Um, then, then there's a second group, which is the launch team or your book ambassadors. And I, I think I might have mentioned that for me, that group was about 278 people. And then there's a third group of people um, that I call the in hopes of people. So maybe you have some influential friends they're too busy to join your launch team, but they might have a podcast or a newsletter or a big social media following. So for those people, I wrote to them and I said, hey, I'd like to get you a copy of my book in hopes that if you find value in it, you would consider sharing it on your social or you would consider, you know, buying it for your organization or it's this in hopes that uh, group of people. And I think with my book, I sent out about 400 copies of my book before it came out. So 278 plus 100 VIPs. So probably like 40 or 50 of the in hopes that people, you know, those influential ones that I wanted to get my book in hand. For any of you who might have the chance to speak at events, I don't know how much that happens for fiction, for nonfiction, it happens a lot. Um, as you're in the phase of, of launching your book, you can consider um, swapping out a speaking fee for your book uh, being purchased for attendees. So my book came out in April of 2022 and in April of, or May of 2022, I had the chance to go to the 
Northern Colorado Writers Association. It was mostly a fiction event. And rather than paying me an honorarium to be at the event, they bought 100 copies of my book and put my book in the bag of every single attendee. So that's a really great way um, to get your book out to more people because as people read your story and love your story and recommend your story, then you can reach beyond uh, the limits of your own network. So when I sent out my book, this picture on the left is a picture of um, how I sent it out. We had like a sticker and a bookmark and a thank you card and a handwritten note, and then I hand signed all the books. So you consider what can, what can you do to make that package more memorable when it lands on people's uh, tables when they bring the mail in. All right, so a chance for you to, to uh, weigh in. What ideas appeal to you for your book launch month? And have you given away books in the past? And if so, has that driven visibility for you? Um, who are the fulfillers who would package those? Deborah, I don't know if there are, like my company, if we have a client, we will help um, send out books. And actually, like now a lot of our authors are doing what we call influencer boxes, where you have a branded box and then all kinds of goodies that go inside. I mean, as it is, I spent $6,000 on the packages that I did that were really low key simple. Um, so, you know, I don't know that I would have invested in like the boxes and all the fancy giveaways. Um, but at, at any rate, when we have a client, we will do that for them. But when with my book, it was like me and my kids again, packing them up at home. <laughs> um, so what about giving away e-copies? Does that work as well? Angie, that's a really great question. And the jury is out. So as it relates to follow through on Amazon reviews, I think there's something magical about when there's a physical book to remind someone to write the review. And when we've done PDF distributions or NetGalley distributions or Edelweiss is another company that does e-galleys, uh, it has not worked as well for us. Um, so Elaine is saying those influencer boxes are really popular with romance bookstagram and they're simple. So, yeah, anything you can do that can make that package stand out, you know, that can entice someone to open it and read the book. Um, man, I wish I could get on the mailing list of the people sending out the kind of books I love to read. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about the advancing phase. Um, and this is the phase of keeping your book in the conversation over time. Um, and so I want to share with you, my book is called Reach. And the way that I define reach is expanding audience plus lasting impact. So I'm guessing, you know, as you think about your book, you want as many people as possible to read your book. But that's not really all of it, is it? Like you want to make connections. You want to make a difference. You want people to remember you and you want people to seek out the books that you'll write after the first one because um, chances are if you love writing, you want to build a career as a writer. So uh, I'm happy to share this definition with you, reach is expanding audience plus lasting impact, because I think as you consider the phase of advancing your book, um, the reason why you want to continue to market your book over time is so that you can have that impact and see your audience grow and, and fuel your writing career. So I want to offer what I call the four reach commitments. And these are the four commitments that you can make as a writer that I think can position you for success over time. Um, so the first one is value. And there are slides for all these, but I'm probably just going to talk to them on this slide. And then the slides will be there for you to review later. Um, the first commitment you make is a, a commitment to show up with value. So when we're thinking about value as it relates to fiction, it's the value of the story. It's the value of, you know, the way that you can uh, bring someone into the world that you've created. But there's also the value of connection. And, you know, Christina told me at the beginning, this is a group of kindness. Sometimes your existence as a human and your ability to relate to others through the writing that you do is the value that you're bringing. So value is not only in the content that you're creating, it's also in the connections that you're building. So the first uh, commitment is that commitment to value. The second commitment is a commitment to consistency. And, you know, this is a hard one for a lot of authors, especially when you're trying to toggle between marketing and 
writing and marketing and writing. Um, and so what I say is you're never going to have a consistent online presence unless you choose an online presence that's sustainable for you. So I would far rather have you say, I'm going to be on Instagram and that's the only one and I'm going to post weekly than for you to say, you know, I'm going to be on Instagram and threads and Facebook and I'm going to post five times a week because, you know, you might show up with a flare and then disappear. So the key to consistency is choosing a sustainable approach. Uh, the next commitment that you need to make is a commitment to longevity, which may be hard to hear. You know, anything that you want to do that's worthwhile takes time. And, you know, I think a lot of times people show up on social media and they think it's going to be instantaneous results. Like if I post on Facebook for six months or Instagram for six months, I'm going to have book sales. Like, why can't I sell any books? Here I am. I've been here for six months. You know, it takes a long time. And I'm sure those of you who have written multiple books see that your success builds with each book that you release. Um, so it's this commitment to show up consistently over time with value for a long time that is the key differentiator for success for authors. Uh, the final and most unexpected of the four commitments is a commitment to generosity. And this is not only about giving books away, although I think giving books away can help. It's about giving of yourself. It's about the support that you can show to other authors in promoting and expanding awareness for their books. It's about the time that you can share with someone who's just starting out. You know, it's about the encouragement that you can give to someone else. It's about the inspiration that you might share, or even it's the sharing of who you are in an authentic way. So that commitment to generosity is one, you know, again, it's, it's maybe not what you expect a marketer to say, but I believe that all four of these together will help you grow an audience over time and make the biggest impact with your work. So again, I'm just going to move through those slides because I'm pretty sure I said everything and then you can read it later as, as a review. Um, so I want to pause for a moment and get some feedback from you. And I'm going to ask a different question than the ones on this slide. And maybe I'll ask the ones on the slide first. But first, as you think about those four commitments, the commitment to value, the commitment to consistency, the commitment to longevity, and the commitment to generosity, which of those is most challenging for you? Go ahead and put that in the chat if you would like. Yes, Deborah, that is the one I always hear. Yes, Cindy, consistency is hard. So I want to encourage those of you who typed consistency to consider, is there a way that you can make your online presence more sustainable so that you can create that consistency? And Elaine, balancing consistency with value. All right, so you could also think about um, what do you believe is the value of the message or the story that you're bringing to others? Um, and you could also think about who is someone you know who does this well, who practices the four commitments of consistency, longevity, uh, generosity, and value. Um, there's something that I saw, tough believing in value. Um, so, Debbie, I want to say to you that, that one thing I've, I've believe more than anything is that the book that you write is the book that only you can write. And the value is the unique experiences that you bring to your work. Um, and I think anyone who chooses to write a book is creating tremendous value. And I just want to affirm you, Debbie, um, and hopefully encourage you. Okay, so I think that is the end of the formal presentation. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Look at that, it's magical. I do have a story that I wanna share at the end. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If there are more questions, if you want to unmute your microphone or and, and talk to me face to face, or you know, if you want to um, put your question in the chat, and I do have a story that I'm holding back. You can ask me about anything like social media, email marketing, launch teams, Amazon, uh, publishing paths, um, any and all. And while you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to go grab the link where you can get a free copy of my book um, because I promised that and I don't want to forget if people leave 
um, before we're done. So, and actually, so here's, here's a, an idea for you. One of the things that I did in my book um, that you'll notice if you get a copy of it is that I have a QR code at the end of every chapter. And uh, the QR code actually takes you to a course where I've created additional resources about my book. Now that might not translate very well for you um, as a fiction author, but you know, you could use a QR code to link to a place where people could sign up to your email list or get a prequel or um, potentially, let's see, what else could it do? Uh, it could take them to a discussion guide and you could encourage them to start a book club to discuss your book. So what is an ideal time frame for having your book up on Amazon for pre-order? Angie, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that there's an ideal time, how long you want that pre-order window to be. So when you're traditionally publishing, you don't have a lot of control over how soon your book is up. Like for my book, which was traditionally published, it was up for pre-order like nine or 10 months in advance, which is the common experience in traditional publishing. In self-publishing, you may have a bit more control. Uh, some hybrid publishers will not set your book up for pre-order at all. They go straight to print on demand. Um, so what I would say is what's most important is how much time you spend to fuel the pre-orders. Um, so with a traditionally published book, the reason why you need to push pre-orders is because you need to send a message to the retailers to stock your book so that when you launch, the book is in stock. If your book is print on demand, none of that really matters because the book will just be printed as people order it. So what I would say, though, is that I don't spend a ton of time or energy pushing pre-orders before about two to three months before the book comes out because people don't want to pre-order a book nine months before it comes out. They'll like lose interest. They'll forget all about it. So I would say two to three months is the amount of time that you want to spend talking about pre-orders. Now, the only exception would be as soon as the pre-order is available, you can do like a soft touch, like, hey, I'm so excited. My book's available for pre-order. I know you probably don't want to buy it nine months in advance, but, you know, I wanted to share this milestone. So sharing those milestones of your author journey is a really great way uh, of just getting people excited and engaged. Um, and I see a bunch more questions coming in, so I will do my best to to answer them all. Friends on the launch team invite others is a good thing. You know, I think so. Um, you know, I think the hard part on the fiction side is that, you know, there's a concern that if you invite people to be on your launch team and give them a free copy, there won't be anyone to buy the book. So, you know, one of the ways that you can circumvent that is you can ask, you know, you can let your friends know, I'm going to give you a free copy, but I hope you'll buy one to give away to someone else. So in that way, you know, expanding um, the launch team to friends of friends is definitely a good thing because the more the merrier. And especially for authors who are just getting started, what you need more than anything is for people to read your book and love your book so they talk about it. Um, so there's a, a big upside there. Um, as far as how you build a street team or a launch team, the first step would be to brainstorm a list of the people who uh, you can invite. I would say the more personal the invitation, the more likely people are to say yes to it. But certainly you can uh, send a, an email to your email list and invite people on your email list to be a part of your launch team. Um, then typically what you want to do is have a plan for how you reach out to people over time and what you ask them to do. So of course you're going to ask them to leave an Amazon review. You know, you can leave a Goodreads review before the book is available. Uh, an Amazon review you can't leave until obviously the book is available for sale on Amazon until the launch date. Um, but you could get people involved early with leaving, you know, Am a Goodreads reviews prior to the publication date. Um, yeah. And then, you know, once people have signed up to be on your launch team, you want to be able to just nurture them by staying in touch with them. Um, on the nonfiction side, and I think this would work on the fiction side too, you want to make it easy for people to share your book on social media. So if you can create graphics or social posts and put them in a Google folder and then say, hey, you know, I've made it easy for you to share my book, you know, you can go and copy paste and share these graphics. Um, you can have a launch, like a party or a, a Zoom meeting for your launch team so they can get more closely connected to you. That can build community as well. Becky, can I make a comment in there? Oh, for sure. So here's what I'm thinking. So in the community, I mean, I would think for a launch team in fiction, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is 
if you're writing mystery and you know other mystery writers and you all get on your same launch team, you have the same audience who's interested in the books, right? And in the in the community, we've got the mystery group, the romance group, the fantasy group. I don't know, but that seems to me like a great place for people to to trade launch teams that everybody everybody in the community is trying to get their books out there and if we all support each other and help each other think of the size like there's over 2500 people in the community and all the genres are covered and i don't know i think we could figure out something there where we help with this launch idea within the community because there's a whole bunch of people you already know or or at least are connected to yeah i love that idea i mean the only hesitation I would have is like, you want people to read your book who love your book. And so if it's not really their genre, you know, right. And, and that's, that's the like hesitancy I would have. So, so that's kind of what I was trying to get to with in, there's a group that's just the mystery writers. So they love mystery. So they should be on a mystery launch team. And then there's the romance writers ah. and they should be on the romance team of you know, there's a whole source of people there that maybe there's something we can do around that to, to help everybody kind of push along. So I'm going to chit chat with Lucy about it because, you know, she runs the community, but I can always step in and talk to her about it. Well, I just love that. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm getting to questions, but I also want to leave time for my final story. Um, I see the question from Michael. If you give your books to people like family and friends who don't read in your genre, are you going to mess up your also bought in Amazon? I wouldn't panic too much about that stuff. Nobody knows how the algorithm works. Uh, Amazon does what Amazon does. And, you know, having more Amazon reviews is better. You know, sometimes people ask me, like, if you give the book for free and I, it looks like, um, you should definitely have them say, I re received an advanced copy of the book. Um, the other thing is, you know, people panic about verified purchase reviews versus, you know, not verified purchase reviews. There's always going to be a mix of both. And so when you have a launch team, if the people don't buy the book, um, it's not going to show up as a verified purchase review, but you'll get plenty of verified purchase reviews. So I don't panic about that either. The only thing you need to know is that, if someone is not an Amazon customer on a regular basis, spending at least $50 a year, they may be blocked from Amazon by leaving a review for your book. So you do want to make sure that people use Amazon regularly before you um, count on them for an Amazon review. They could still be on your launch team, even if they're not an Amazon shopper and leave a review on Goodreads or what's that new platform? Uh, Storygraph? Is that what it is? There's a new one that people are using instead of Goodreads. Okay. All right. I want, I'm going to take a moment in just a second. I'm going to put a whole bunch of links in the chat. There's a link to my company website, a link to my personal website, a link to my podcast, a link to my book. And then also on social media, I use the same handle everywhere. Um, and I would love to have you connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me on um Instagram or follow me on threads. And I'm always my first name, Becky, and my last name, R-B-N-S-N. It's like my last name without the vowels. That's where I am on all the social platforms. So I, I put all of those links in the chat for you. I would love to stay connected. Um, and if it's okay, Christina, I want to share a story before we wrap up. Would that be all right with everybody? All right. Um, it's just going to take me a second to get my slides showing again because I had to get those links. Um, by the way, it is always my goal to share value in every interaction. So I'll, I would be curious to hear from all of you uh, what you found value in. If you want to take a minute to put that in the chat, but I want you to get like lean into this story. It's a good one. All right. So uh, this is a photo of the house where I live. I live in uh, the south east corner of Michigan. This is actually a picture from the early 90s. And when this house was first built, Mike and Kathy Satarski, who are the people who built the house and bought the land, um, were hoping to create a place where their family could have peace and quiet into the future. Uh, but there was one major problem with that. And the major problem is that we live on a fairly busy country road. The house is set back from the road 
uh, by about 0.15 miles. So you can see the part of the picture that you can't see is the way the driveway curves up to the main road. But at the time that Mike and Kathy bought the house, in between the house and the road was like an open field. And so that meant that they could always see the cars going by and they could always hear the noise of the cars and they didn't have the privacy and peace that they wanted. Now they had just built their dream house, so they didn't have a lot of money to buy full grown trees. So what they did is uh, Mike bought about 500 trees. And what I heard from him when I met him is that they were so small that those trees all fit in a wheelbarrow. And Mike and his two sons painstakingly planted 500 trees around the property. And if you've ever planted trees, you might know that you can't just plant trees once. You know, once you've planted those 500 seedlings and cultivated them and watered them, you know, they don't all make it. So every year, Mike and his sons were planting trees. Um, and they were doing that because they believed in a future that was more beautiful than the one that they were currently living in. And even though it took a lot of work, and even though it took a lot of patience, and even though it took time and energy and money, they were building into the future that they hoped to create. So those of us who are writing and who are building online communities and who are looking for audience, uh, we realize that we are trying to build into a future that's different than the one that we're living in. And we realize that it's going to take a lot of time and energy and effort and money. Uh, and we realize that not every tree will grow, not every seed will blossom, but we continue on day after day showing up with value in a consistent way giving generously of all we have over a long period of time, because we know that when we do that, we will build that beautiful future that we envision. And so for that reason, I happen to live in this beautiful property that's completely surrounded by trees. I can't see the road. Now, small change. We took the pool out. It was old. Nobody was using it. Uh, and, you know, my husband is adding to that legacy because since we moved in seven years ago, eight years ago, you know, we've had to continue to add more trees to, to keep up the legacy that we all hoped uh, to live into this beautiful and peaceful place. So I want to encourage all of you today that you are doing important and good work when you put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and you share your best ideas and stories with the world. And I hope that you will choose to be someone who would plant 500 trees and wait for them to grow. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the interaction, all the great questions. Becky, that was a fabulous presentation. I took lots of notes, um, you know, being a fiction and nonfiction writer, it was super helpful on, on both sides and um, also have some great ideas for the community, which is always wonderful to see what we can do in there to help help writers, you know, get their books out there and, and read. Um, and Elaine, you and I are going to talk out offline about, about uh, your book. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day.